When it jumps from its short runway, the plane will accelerate from zero to 200. The F-100B project was meant to take advantage of the Hun's reconfiguration into a tactical strike aircraft. The limited speed of the F-100 design around Mach 1.25 prompted a redevelopment effort to make a plane that could approach Mach 2. Features were added to gear the aircraft for tactical fighter-bomber missions. These features soon came to dominate the design and included a recess in the hull providing semi-submerged nuclear weapon storage. This innovation was actually rediscovered 30 years later and given the name conformal storage. To safely eject the bombs from this recess, the air intake for the engine was shifted to the top of the fuselage as it had with the Hun. Tactical consideration came to totally dominate the F-100B. Air Force approval to proceed with the design was given on June 11, 1954. This was followed a month later by the issue of a new designation for the aircraft. The F-100B became the F-107. By that time, the changes had become so radical to the F-107A, really little had left in common with the Hun. The fuselage, in addition to its shark fin intake, was 50% longer than the 100. Like the Super Saber, the F-107 featured many innovations, including an all-movable vertical tail surface and variable air intake ducts. The plane had also a multitude of built-in equipment, including chaff dispensers, radar beacons, maneuverable autopilot, and computerized stability augmentation. With this avionics package, the F-107A was really a leap into the future of the electronic development. The first F-107A took flight on September 10, 1956, at Edwards Air Force Base. The test series went ahead. Though there were some minor problems evident, North American was increasingly confident that it would all be a hot seller. The 107 was in competition with the Republic F-105, which appeared to be encountering developmental problems and wasn't ready to fly. The fly ops were postponed. North American referred to the F-107 as the Super Saber Saber. The biggest worry was that once the 107 won the contract, construction would go to Republic, whose factory had no work of its own. Despite North American's confidence, the decision when announced came down on the side of Republic's F-105. Now, it was obvious that the F-107 would never be built in its numbers. An initial 33 examples had been contracted, but the only three test aircraft were fully built. It's said that the 105 won because it's internal bomb bay. Although this feature was never really used, the F-107 was left with the bitter consolation of being one of the best planes not to win an Air Force contract. But the F-107's failure didn't negate the F-100's success and the Super Saber soon took its place in the front line of the U.S. Air Force. The late 50s and early 60s was a time of peace, and North America took the chance to refine the plane. The F-100B model, which introduced integrated refueling gear, carried an astounding array of non-nuclear stores. Over 75 weapons, bomb racks, ECM pods, and launchers for rockets, mines, flares, and sundry other attachments were compatible with the plane. The D had a number of significant adjustments, including the landing flaps, greater wing area, and a taller tail. Over the years, the C and D models appeared in a number of many variations. With some different cockpit layouts, 148D models were even equipped with zero-length launch. 
In 1962, an extensive program was begun to standardize the existing Huns. The program took until 1965 to complete, with an average of 60 days spent to modify each plane. But after the refit, Tactical Air Command finally had what it wanted, a fleet of advanced combat-ready F-100s. The F-100 went to war on the 9th of June 1964, sent to strike a target in the tiny nation of Laos. Eight pilots flying F-100s attacked the path to Laos stronghold in a reprisal raid. This was in retaliation for the shooting down of a Navy reconnaissance plane. It would only be the first of hundreds of missions flown over Southeast Asia, where, time and time again, the plane would prove its worth in battle. From the first raid onward, the Huns' involvement gradually escalated. In March 1965, Operation Rolling Thunder began. The United States had become fully entangled in the conflict, and, as the leading tactical fighter on the spot, so did the F-100. Vietnam lacked landing fields or jet-powered aircraft and the U.S. rapidly began building new installations. These included new bases at Viennois, Thanh Reng, Phuket, and Tua. All would see immense Super Sabre activity in the years to come. At many locations in Vietnam, pairs of 10,000-foot runways were built together with accommodation, administration, and maintenance facilities. In terms of modern airfields, South Vietnam became one of the most richly endowed nations on Earth. At the peak of their deployment, 490 F-100s were operating from South Vietnamese bases. Other units were stationed in Thailand. Aircrafts and units were rotated so that the most of the Air Force's Sabres saw action at one time or another. Even the two sea traders arrived on the scene, to be re-equipped as the first Wild Weasel aircraft. They would soon be wrecking devastation on enemy anti-aircraft installations. In 1966, the base at Phan Run was one of the first to receive an all F-100 fighter wing. It remained a center of Super Sabre activity throughout the war. At one time, 140 operated from the field. By the middle of 1967, four fighter wings, the 3rd, 31st, 35th, and 37th, were operating the Hun in Vietnam. Although histories of the Vietnam Air War might make only passing reference to the F-100s, it's not because they weren't there in numbers, perhaps not as glamorous as other planes. Their contribution to the war effort was irreplaceable. In long-range strikes against North Vietnam, the Super Sabre's weakness became evident when compared to the newer F-105 and F-4. In such company, the F-100 was definitely outclassed. However, the F-100 served admirably as the aerial artillery so desperately needed by U.S. ground troops. At times, this was the most important task performed by the Air Force, especially to the grunts toughing it out below. To the F-100s operating with forward air controllers or FACs would drop their loads with devastating effect. Their missions can be described simply. Briefing, Takeoff, refueling, flying to a set of coordinates, rendezvousing with the fact, locating and attacking targets, finally heading back to the base for more ordnance. A clinical description for what was a devastating endeavor. Pattern of the missions was repetitive, and those missions were flown in vast numbers. As early as 1969, the four wings stationed in South Vietnam had flown more combat missions than the combined total of the thousands of P-51 Mustangs engaged in World War II. The 
intensity never let up, and airfields in South Vietnam became the busiest in the world. In January 1967, figures for the base at Vienna showed 65,000 takeoffs and landings. This translates to one every 42 seconds for 31 days. Many of those were F-100s. In light of this, the word busy takes on a new and fuller meaning. As soon as the plane arrived back at base, a de-arming crew cleared the guns and reset the safety pins. Only then could the flurry of maintenance, fueling, and rearming begin. With the crew chiefs checking and rechecking the plane during the process, they were quickly readied for the next action. In practice, the Huns would fly two missions a day. Operational readiness figures achieved by the F-100s in Vietnam sometimes registered above 95%, which was a credit to the planes and their crews. The 31st Tactical Fighter Wing operated five squadrons of F-100s. This meant that its base, Tiwa, had the highest concentration of Huns in South Vietnam. In addition to its three regular squadrons, two Air National Guard squadrons were attached to it. The National Guard forces deployed to Vietnam proved to be among the most effective units in the theater, partly due to the age and experience of the pilots and, in part, of the stability of their personnel. These squadrons shot down the old flying club image of the Air National Guard. Instead, they proved to be a strong, invaluable reserve. After their performance under fire, the F-100s phased out of guard service were replaced with brand new aircraft. In earlier days, they would have been issued hand-me-downs from the regular Air Force. In fact, General George Brown stated that the best five F-100 squadrons in Vietnam were National Air Guard units. These five included the two guard units attached to the 31st Wing, Atwila, the 136th from New York, and the 188th from New Mexico. Tiwa was another of the new bases begun in May of 1966. By November of that same year, F-100s were operating from the airstrip there. Its temporary aluminum matting runway was still in use long after a concrete runway was laid beside it in 1967. The installation was finally abandoned in mid-1970. With its seemingly endless rounds of raids and replenishment, the activity of TWA wasn't much different from the other F-100 bases of the war. The 31st brought with it about 110 aircraft. 44 National Guard planes were later added, making a total of over 150 Huns. Day and night, the routines at the base went on, with the men working a minimum of six days a week to keep up with the deadly rotation of strikes. By the time a plane was ready for its mission, it would be loaded with fuel, ammunition, and stores to the point where a pilot needed every inch of the airstrip just to take off. Tui Wa's runway faced out to sea, and, with mountains at the other end of the strip, most landings and takeoff went over the beach. The view may have been nice, but variable sea breezes averaging around 25 knots and blowing across the runways tended to complicate matters. F-100 missions fell into two basic categories. Planned strikes preceded by extensive briefings and combat emergencies. Responses to urgent calls from help from forward air controllers or army units. F-100s also joined in pilot rescue operations, sometimes providing a wall of suppressive fire encircling enemy troops. The aircraft was fast and its bases were spread over all of South Vietnam. 
Planes would often be in the air and over a target within minutes. Sometimes, the men on the ground would call down strikes on only 50 yards from their own positions. This is a tribute to the planes and their pilots. Because the grunts on the ground would have to be far more wary for any calling of help. If the Super Sabres hadn't established a solid reputation for getting there fast and hitting only what they shot at. The need for an extreme accuracy in supporting ground troops was an additional and not inconsiderable burden on already tense pilots. Vietnam was a major testing ground for US military hardware, and some of it turned out to be terribly inadequate. The Bull Pup missile was a case in point. Against entrenched targets, the toggle-controlled Bull Pup wasn't much more than a nuisance, even if their aim was true. And, they were less than a total success against reinforced bridges, which were just the kind of target most likely to justify their expensive use. They may have represented the cutting edge of technology one time, but in battle, they proved to a lack of cutting edge of their own. Some of the smart weaponry that showed up later was far more effective and represented a revolution in weaponry that few could have envisioned. Most of the work of the Huns was done with basic ordnance like tumbling, unfinned napalm canisters. And 500 and 750 pound iron bombs of World War II design. In addition, there were four cannons, each with 200 rounds, which gave the Super Saber its lethal strafing power. By 1970, replacement of the F-100s with F-4s and F-111s was proceeding rapidly. Many of the airframes had passed 5,000 hours, and the F-100's age was telling. It had been an old design when it entered in combat, outclassed by opposing MiGs. It was simply no longer in the race as an air superiority weapon. However, it made quite a name for itself in its support of the army and was also the first wild weasel aircraft. As the war drew to a close, the F-100s left Vietnam, unit by unit. The last of the 35th Tactical Wing F. Thang Rang disappeared in July 1971. Huns flew 360,283 sorties in Vietnam, more operational sorties than any other type in that war. 243 of the planes were lost, 198 of those in combat. The majority of the F-100s used in foreign air forces were second-hand. In 1958, the French were the first foreign country to receive new Super Sabres. They operated 100 of them, with 15 of the F models and 85s. These remained in French service until 1980. Denmark also had three squadrons of Huns and operated them until 1982, and Taiwan received and operated second-hand A models which were later upgraded. By far, the largest customer for second-hand Super Sabres was Turkey. Out of the over 300 eventually purchased, the Turks reportedly still have some F-100s in storage, but generally, the Super Sabre wasn't a great foreign sales success for North American. And, with the failure of the F-107, they were left without any fighter contracts whatsoever. But North American didn't give up on the fighter building business. On the contrary, they were already working on the Mach 3 F-108 Rapier, which, like the XP-70 Valkyrie, was to be another step into the future. In June 1957, the company was given a contract to develop a proposal that had been initiated in 1955. 
the plane envisaged would be an interceptor capable of operating at Mach 3 at 70,000 feet. It would have been able to fly 1,000 miles from its base, launching a missile and be back home and on the ground in half an hour. The aim was to destroy incoming missiles or bombers far out at sea. Unfortunately, the plane would have carried an enormous price tag, and after viewing the mock-up in January 1959, the Air Force backed off. On September 23, 1959, North American advised of the Rapier Program's cancellation after only three generations, all of which had been illustrious ones. The company's days of fighter construction were at an end. After Vietnam, Huns remained in service solely with the National Guard and by 1972 had completely phased out of the Air Force use. But almost no low-time planes were left. Having become a relic, they were gradually phased out. They had been with the Guard for over 21 years and several pilots had logged over 5,000 flying hours in them. The last operational National Guard flight was on the 10th of November 1979. The only flights after that were ferrying operations. The F-100 is now a thing of the past. It was the product of an experimental age and bridged two separate eras between 1949 and 1979. A lot had happened in aviation. The plane had gone from the world record holder to a non-contender even before its production cycle was over. And although it had no fancy avionics, pilots grew to love it both for the plane it was and for the hard lessons it taught them. Among old Hun jockeys, there is little dissent about what it's worth. At one time, the subject of considerable doubt, the superceiver, ended its career with a proud reputation and with the distinction of its performance in Vietnam. That reputation is sure to live on for a very long time. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.